And instead of um, you know, asking this, all the speakers to address the questions, you see some of them did. The, the clinicians really paid, paid attention, and the basic scientists <laughs> didn't, which is typical. Which is, uh, uh, but uh, we, we came up with our own list, and I, I think we will just go ahead and have a free-for-all. I, I think the first question here is so general. What are the underlying genetic and hormonal environmental factors determining covariance of bone and muscle mass? Let's take that one later. But let's go right to number two, because I thought this came up in a number of the talks, at least for me. Is the osteocyte the only mechanostat, and how does it modulate at the cellular level the relationship between muscle loading and bone? And I thought um, in Ellie's talk, I was wondering the same question. Is uh, Clearly, there's other cells that have the capability to sense you know, forces, presumably in muscle and you know, in, in, in the, even in the joints area, so in the, in the converse site. So maybe that could be an opening question, and we'll take it from there. Uh, I just want I just want to say one thing related to that, and that is that there are fish, some kind of fish that don't have uh, osteocytes, and still, I mean, I, I don't know if they have bone remodeling or response to mechanical load, but definitely they do well without it. So there must be other mechanisms as well. That, uh, okay. I guess just to expand on that, you know, I mean, based on what we know, certainly the osteocyte is a prime sensor of mechanical strains, and it may be kind of the, the cell that's triggering uh, remodeling or, or modeling. But in addition to that, it's very possible, for example, that you know, the, the osteoblasts themselves are somehow able to sense mechanical strain and modulate their activity or survival in, in a cell autonomous way related to, to strain. I think, you know, those kinds of effects on how specific cell types in the bone microenvironment might modulate their function uh, independent of kind of the signals from the osteocyte is, I think, another uh, important area to look at. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to echo that. I think the, the importance of the osteocyte cannot be underestimated, but for the osteocyte to be a mechanotransducer and a specific one or exclusive one, you would think that it would express genes that are not expressed by osteoblast and, I would, and would convey this function. And that has not been shown yet. So I think the exclusivity of a mechanostat for, the, for osteocyte is, cannot be defined yet on, based on the molecular data that we have. Well, I was, was going to say, I mean, I think I'm looking over at Vince Caeso, too. I mean, it's, it's been clear for many years that, that adult muscle cells are very mechanically sensitive. And, and this is most commonly associated with mass. But I think, you know, I think that's just be, be, been because that's been the primary variable we've looked at. But you can just take a m muscle cell and put it under passive tension, in the, in, either in the presence or absence of the nerve. And you can influence whether it's through tri trip channels or, at this point, some still unknown mecha mechanically sensitive channel that will trigger a number of different calcium-related calcium signaling and a variety of signaling transduction mechanisms that one could link to regulation of uh, synthesis of growth factors and other things like that that could it then add to this milieu. So I, I you know, I, I, I guess this, this is where this is an unusual aspect for me as a muscle biologist with the bone people is just that I kind of consider all, adult, at least the adult muscle cells, I can't, I don't know for sure about satellite cells, but at least within the muscle tissue, those muscle cells, each one of them, in theory, is a mechanosensitive cell. And so the idea that you have very specialized cells in bone is, is a different concept and would present some different modeling perspectives. So can, can I add a comment on this? I, I guess from the clinical data I saw, we saw a lean muscle mass increase before the bone mass did. And I would argue in, in resistance, I mean, Karen, you know this better than I do. In, in resistance exercise training, you're probably going to get increases in muscle mass before you do bone mass. So I think the interesting question there is to ask, how do the mechanical, how do the, I don't know if I want to call them mechanostats, but how do the mechanically sensitive cells in the muscle talk to the bone and do they talk back and forth? I think that's the very interesting question because if you can inhibit the bone ability to respond to what the muscle is doing, 
in some way, will you then stop bone mass from increasing or vice versa? But the muscle certainly is much more dynamically flexible in terms of increasing or decreasing its mass before the bone remodeling takes place. So I, I think that looking at the factors and genes involved in that would be very interesting and that, that, that undoubtedly will require quite a bit of animal model work. Candice Tehimik, uh, San Francisco Veterans Affairs. Uh, I'm rather new to the field. Actually, I do come from a stem cell uh, biology. Um, uh, I do have that background. And I was um, quite uh, really amazed uh, with what was discussed early this morning. Um, I was just wondering whether we should restrict our um, perception that perhaps it's bone and muscle or that they're the, the mechanical transducers or the sensors for mechanical load are solely residing within the bone or muscle compartment. Um, in the recent uh, Cronenberg paper that appeared in Cell, somehow the group has alluded that there are rather um, perivascularly um, located um, multipotent stem cell populations that, um, of course, uh, go into circulation and can repopulate the bone niche. So from my, my take on this is that could it be possible that we should also consider cells in circulation, particularly those um, in the perivascular niche? Um, of course, with exercise, we do see an increase in blood pressure, and I work on mechanical loading these days. Uh, with this increase in blood pressure, um, these cells, of course, expo are exposed to um, shear stress uh, at the vessel wall. So perhaps we might expand our view. It's not just muscle, it's um, in the circulation, it's in the wall of the vessel itself. I would like to hear your comments on that. Well, actually, I, I was just, in, in one of the things, and I, I think, and again, I think this is probably true in the bone field as well as in the muscle field, especially when you think about exercise and, and muscle gain, it's very site specific. So if, if I go and work out my biceps on my right arm, um, except for a few interesting papers out about being able to visualize muscle growth, for the most part, you really got to make the muscle work to make it grow. So there, so you know, when when we think about exercise, that there are clearly some permissive factors I think that might happen under exercise, but but there has to be that load associated, probably growth factor associated, and it's very specific. And so, under that those suggestions, I'm not saying that those cells may not contribute to that growth, but there has to be something happening in that site and in that tissue for that adaptation to occur. And I think that's true with bone. Is that right? Uh, can we just, let's, let's we've, we've spent most, half the time already on osteocytes. Let's conclude that there are other mechanosensor cells. It's likely that it's not just the osteocyte. And I just, let's go on to the third one because I think this, this is what are the similarities and differences between muscle bone interactions during development, homeostasis, disease, or injury? And we heard really elegantly from Mary Leonard how this, in fact, I was surprised, I didn't, I guess I didn't read that paper, how I was expecting cortical bone to really be profoundly changed and the relationship to muscle bone isn't so clear there. So let's have a discussion of that and maybe, um, so is this a disease thing per se or have we not studied the relationship between muscle mass and, corti and cortical bone formation in the way we should have dreamed development? Uh, well, I, th I think it's hard because I know I went back and forth between some data and healthy um, populations as well, sick kids. So that one graph that showed changes in bone relative to changes in muscle did show a very nice linear relationship um, in the healthy controls. And that was the place where a one standard deviation increase in muscle was associated with a 0.4 standard deviation in periosteal circumference. Um, and and the, the advantage of that, um, those analyses is we're finally getting to the place where we have longitudinal control data, because I think that's really important since it's difficult to make any sort of conclusions cross-sectionally. In the cross-sectional paper, when I showed that the increases in the greater muscle didn't explain the sex and race differences, there still was an incredibly strong positive association between muscle and bone. It's just that it didn't fully explain the sex and race differences. And unlike some of the da data that Dr. Koso presented, we didn't find any evidence of an interaction between gender and muscle. Um, but, but in any event, coming back to the pediatric data, you know, I think we're really struck by how there's this real disconnect. And so instead of talking about the functional muscle bone unit, we tend to talk about the dysfunctional muscle bone unit because we're not seeing the kind of increases in cortical dimensions that we would expect. And now I think it, I've presented data in a couple different diseases, but we have it in even more diseases, a very consistent story. If you're on steroids or if you have inflammation, you're not getting that gain in periosteal circumference. You should, given the gains in muscle. And then I'll, 
also was struck with, with uh, Brad's and Ellie's description of during development the fluidity, or the greater fluidity perhaps that these growth factors that we tend to think stay in one place but actually can diffuse across regions. Does, do you think there is more like an open system during development that might close off during the adult situation where you have a, you basically have fascia and a bundle of muscle, you know, do, or do you think that's still possible that growth factors come from one compartment and can act in the other? Either, either one. Uh, yeah, that's for you. Yeah. Um, I really don't know. I mean, it's uh, it's it's a very interesting uh, question, I think, and uh, uh, it, it's it's difficult to tackle. Like, uh, but I, I thought during uh, the talk about the Indian that maybe to do more mouse genetics and to ablate receptors in one tissue or the the, the ligands and the other tissue will, will bring a more uh, direct uh, effect to such a possibility. Um, so, and also, it, there might be a way to visualize activation of the pathway in different tissue relative to, but th that's definitely a very interesting and intriguing uh, possibility. Well, I think given the, uh, the availability now of the ability to knock things out postnatally yeah. yeah. or in conditions of stress, I think, uh, right. you know, Recapitulating a developmental a developmental situation mm -hmm. in the adult and then asking if it has a similar effect would be right. interesting. So w one of the issues is I think most of the morphogens in development, the Wnt family, the the TGF beta super family, the FGF family, the hedgehogs, they all require actually probably multiple co-receptors to function and. Typically, a lot of these factors are considered paracrine factors. They're not circulating factors, at least the non-circulating FGFs. Well, I think we're going to hear about a circulating one later. But they're anchored in the extracellular matrix. And when they are interacting with proteoglycans, um, typically that's what they interact with, they're extremely stable. So I know FGFs can survive for a very long time in the extracellular matrix. And that's why we don't really know what the ligand is. I don't know if the ligand that we're looking at was laid down long before or if it's produced and transported somehow, but certainly from the studies in invertebrates, long distance signaling of these ligands is, it involves extracellular matrix components and transport. So that's going to be a difficult question to answer and, and I think it's a very important one to answer because I don't think that we necessarily are going to find something that's made locally that's acting locally. It may have been made at a distant site and laid down and is acting much later. I might just add, you know, just to draw the parallels between muscle and bone, obviously that's a concept that's been around in the bone field for a long time and has kind of been highlighted by several recent papers by Zhu Kao and the idea that the bone matrix uh, you know, is rich in TGF beta and more recently IGF1, and that may have been laid down quite some time ago. But when the bone is resorbed, those factors come out and stimulate osteoblast function. So there may be some interesting parallels there in terms of growth factors that are kind of deposited and, you know, have an action much later in time.